But I uh, do appreciate the opportunity to speak here. I uh, also appreciate those from the nonprofit community who have come out uh, this afternoon. Uh, you all have taught me a lot and have helped me get to this point. And I hope to be able to work with you all as we bring the Better Yes Network uh, into fruition and, and, uh, and, and further along. So uh, what we think about uh, with policy and with poverty is uh, we, we had an approach here at the Locke Foundation and it was uh, difficult to translate into English. Fortunately, uh, working with nonprofits uh, who are working with people in communities uh, is a lot easier to because it starts in English. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's a helpful thing. And with that, I uh, want to start talking about the unpolicy solutions, the things that happen without government, um, uh, without a direct government role, uh, with, with one person's story. And it's, it's a mom's story. And uh, in this particular mom, you may have seen stories like hers elsewhere, but, but this, is, uh, this is a woman we'll call Tiffany. Uh, it's not her real name. Uh, it, the organization that worked with her uh, wanted to protect her name, but uh, she lives in Section 8 housing. She's lived there all her life. And she lives in Section 8 housing that's so bad that the, house, the Department of Housing and Urban Development is closing it down. Um, and they don't do that that often. It's, it's got to be bad, right? Uh, but as with m many uh, young women who grow up in that situation, where there are generations of dependency and there are broken families, she found herself pregnant multiple times. Uh, she is pregnant with her seventh child from two different fathers. And when we think about poverty, we're thinking about, in many cases, somebody like Tiffany. And the question comes up, how do we help? How do we help somebody like that? And when I was here at the Locke Foundation, we of course knew all the answers. I knew all the answers here. Uh, and the first answer was, well, get government out of there. What is government doing trying to save somebody from a bad situation. How can government, the government programs are the things that created this bad situation. They create dependency. They, government taxes penalize marriage. It's what is the problem. And government not only distorts incentives for individuals, but it distorts it for the nonprofits who are in there providing help, human service organizations. Uh, a few years ago, the Urban Institute found that government funding accounted for over 65% of revenue for human service organizations and was the largest funding source for 60% of those organizations. Nearly half of grants and contracts go to large nonprofits, those with revenues of over a million dollars. And there are, there's research that shows that when a nonprofit organization takes $1,000 in government grants, it stops fundraising. And as a result, it ends up with only a net of $385. So it gets $1,000 from state government, from government of any level, st stops doing some of the things that it was doing, ends up earning only $385 because it doesn't receive private funding anymore. And so now it's more vulnerable. And that doesn't include the administrative cost and the compliance cost and the mission cost that before you were doing what you set out to do and now because you have this money your mission is distorted a bit. Uh, that's not included in there. But the problem was with that we had that I had especially at the Locke Foundation and that we have in general among uh, policy wonks and, and those who would explain uh, these the, the, the way to get out of this is that many times when we say it's the government's fault because of the policies that we recommend and the ways that we look to accomplish the goals, it ends up sounding like we're blaming the person who's in that bad situation. We're saying it's your fault <coughs> because we say we need to have drug testing if you're going to be on welfare. We need to have work requirements. We, you can only be on unemployment for three weeks. And these may be good ideas, but they just sound awful. They sound uncaring. And when you sound uncaring, nobody cares what you have to say after that. 
So we may be right. We may have been right. But nobody cared because we didn't show that we cared. Then I had the great benefit uh, of working in state government. And I do have to start when talking about government that those, the, the folks on the right and the folks on the left have this really distorted view of government employees. People on the left think that if we just respect the government more, we could get better people into state government or into federal government. And people on the right think, well, think all kinds of other things about, federal, about government employees. But working with them side by side uh, while, I, while I was there and working to try to find efficiencies and reforms, I found out that all the ideas, all the great ideas that we had here at the Locke Foundation, they already had. They just couldn't pull them off. Uh, and, and, and I found out that I wasn't much additional assistance on that side. It's really hard to make change in government. Um, but they are very diligent. They're great stewards of the, fe uh, of, of the taxpayer dollar because they are taxpayers themselves and they recognize that role. Many of them do. And so the, 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 the issue is that when you're working in government, the reason why you're in government is because you think you can do a good job for the people of the state while you're there. And what better way to do something for the people of the state or the people of the country than to do something? Um, it's really hard to say, I'm here to stop doing things. Um, and so our focus was on, can we get the right data? Can we get the right measures to show the programs that work? Because once we got the right programs and the right answers, we'd be able to direct money from the things that don't work to the things that do work, and then we'd actually be able to make the change that we all thought was possible. Um, problem that we ran into was that we couldn't figure out and couldn't agree on what the right questions were. I can't tell you the number of times somebody in state government would say, if we could only get everybody onto the same page, we'd be in great shape. I see the people who work in government are laughing at that one because they've heard it many times too. Um, the problem is that every time that somebody says, let's all get on the same page, they mean my page. Because uh, your page is not quite the right page because this is the page that is the right page to get to the place that we need to be. Uh, and while we're all debating that, even if we could get onto the same page and could agree on what the right question was, right, the right, what the right answer was, we ran into the other problem that for every dollar that the state spends, we get 60, 65 to 75 cents from the federal government. Well, that means that they get to say a lot of what we get to do. And it makes it extremely difficult. South Carolina tried for four years to reform their Medicaid program so that they could try a small program of sending nurses into families' houses. It took them four years to get the federal government to even make some kind of modern, modest modification to the Medicaid program, which is where most of the savings were going to come from. And they ended up with an agreement, but it wasn't what they had intended to do, and it wasn't nearly the, the scope which, which, with which they had originally started. So that is an extremely difficult thing. But while the, I was blessed that while I was there, while I was in state government, about the time that I started, I, I got to see firsthand in the Dominican Republic and in Uganda what is possible and what is possible in Uganda in a place where government is complete, it's completely dysfunctional and corrupt, uh, where the president is, has been in office for 30 years and he kind of sort of won an election again. <laughs> but that was in part by putting his main opposition candidate under house arrest for the last week of the, of the campaign. And now that main candidate is again on trial for treason in, in that country. But the organization that we worked with there, every place we went within Uganda, people would say, oh, you're working with them. That's the future of the country. And we were there with a uh, pastor of a church in Chicago. And he said, I could learn so much from what is happening here and could bring that back to Chicago if I could just figure out how to do that. And uh, so I was going into it with, well, let's get property rights. And I came out of it saying, you know, there's more to it. There's less to it and more to it. And that's the, the better, yes, there's a better way to do this. And the first part of it, um, and part of that has to do with uh, 
I was able to read some books because as a policy guy, you can't really believe your eyes until you see somebody wrote it down. Uh, because there's nothing's real until somebody has done research on it or or or, or proven it. So uh, there's an old book uh, called *The Tragedy of American Compassion* that takes a look at what effective uh, charity is. *When Helping Hurts* is a more recent book, and *Toxic Charity* both came out about the same time, 2011, and they provided a language for what I saw. *When Helping Hurts* also provided the benefit that in that book. Uh, was a description of an organization that I had never heard of called Jobs for Life. And there's a great story about what they, were do what they did for, uh, with, for a man in Tennessee. So after reading that, I looked it up. It was over, over the Christmas holidays. I looked it up. I said, wait, they're here in Raleigh. Uh, and so that was one of those eye-opening things that I've been involved, I've been in this community for how long? Working on how do we make policy change, and I haven't paid attention to the people who are actually making change on a personal level. Uh, so I thank Daniel Alexander from uh, Jobs for Life for being here today and for helping me understand more of it, and Shea Bethay as well, thank you. Um, and I'll be pointing out some other folks from the community, uh, and I, I will miss some, so if I miss you when I get to that point of this presentation, please let me know that you're, you're here. So that language, though, started with redefining poverty. When we think about poverty, especially from a policy side, and especially from a government side, we think about it in terms of material goods. We, we're lacking stuff. We're lacking money. And so, and that, and that uh, you know, as government, that's what we're really good at. We're, we can write checks. We can give stuff. Um, but if it was just material that was lacking, then we wouldn't have any rich person who is in poverty either. And they wouldn't be trying to accomplish something that they can't. They wouldn't be looking for something besides money to fill the holes that they have in their lives. Um, all right, music fan, I gotta say it. Prince might still be with us. Um, so if it was just material, but it's not. There's the personal side of it, which is what can you contribute? What do you have that is worth, th worth something to somebody else in the community? What kind of contribution can you make? And if you're unemployed, if you've been unemployed, you know this feeling. If you're in a job that you feel trapped in, you know this feeling. What else can I do? This is, I'm not good at this, I don't like this, but what else can I do? I'm unemployed, nobody will hire me. What, what can I do that will have value to somebody else? And that ties into the social aspect. Who can you rely on? Right? When you're in that situation, you start cutting yourself off be, from people because you have nothing to contribute and you're now in one-way relationships with everybody who's set, giving you something. There's something valuable, though, to relying on people. A friend of ours was telling us about when her son took his scooter out and, and tied the dog leash to it. Well, you can imagine what happened, right? The dog leash, within 30 feet, got caught in the front tire. He went flying over the scooter and came home, and fortunately, Mom was there to bandage his wounds. You need somebody there when you're in poverty to provide the equivalent of hydrogen peroxide and Band-Aids. Underlying all of it, though, is the spiritual side, that there's a lack of meaning. Do you, it leaves you with the question of, do you even matter? I can't contribute. What, what do I have? Laura Hillenbrand, in the book Unbroken, uh, about Louis Zamperini, who was imprisoned and beaten in Japanese prisoner of war camps, uh, talked about how he survived that. And it was by finding within himself that dignity that we each, that all of us have, but that sometimes we lose the sense of. And she said, without dignity, identity is erased. That's the spiritual core of poverty. And the Better Yes members, those organizations that we work with and are looking to work with, they get this. And because they get this, they start with relationship. They don't start with what can we give you, they start with who are you? Why are you here? How did you get in this position? What can you do is oftentimes one of the first questions that gets asked. What can you do to contribute? What, what are the things that you have that are of value? And sometimes it's not the person that you're talking with who has to provide that answer. It's the person who's also, who is also in the room who says, she is great at cooking. He can fix a bike like nobody. They tell you 
what the person is good at because they've forgotten. The person that you're talking to may have forgotten. And then you provide them with some responsibility. And again, that's about providing something that's valuable to the person that you're, that you're talking with. Um, if you go into a place and you say, I'm looking for a bed, and they give you a bed, I always think of Uncle Ben talking to Peter Parker. Right? With, great with great power comes great responsibility. Well, now you've come in, and I've given you something, and I haven't asked you to take responsibility for it. What have I told you about what kind of power you have? You have no power in this relationship. So the first step is to, after establishing the relationship, is to provide you with the responsibility for the good of the community. So soup kitchens do that with having people work uh, in the kitchen. Uh, food pantries do that as they allow people to go through and make choices about the food that they want instead of just getting a box. And when you provide that responsibility and you develop that relationship, it l reduces the resentment on both sides. And it increases the ability to have restoration, to be restored to that sense of dignity, to that sense of self, to that place in the community. That's what these organizations do the organizations that we're looking to pull together in the Better Yes Network, they start with relationship and responsibility and that leads to restoration. That's their ultimate goal. It's not about how many people, it's not about how many meals, it's about how many folks have come through this and are now restored and the way that they come back is as an alumni so that they can mentor other people and build new relationships and have new responsibilities. And they do that in a number of areas. Because when you are in poverty, you have a number of needs. You may send your child to a good school, whether a charter school or a low cost private school or even a traditional public school. But you may have a broken family. And how do you make sure that your child is, is coming home to the right environment? You may have a, a steady home environment for your child, but your neighborhood isn't, isn't the best. How do you allow your child to walk to school or to, what do, you allow, what do they do? What kind of options do they have? What kind of friends can they have in their community? Employment is part of that dignity. We gain, we gain dignity through work. Housing and health are other aspects of it. And so Brace Boone, I mentioned Daniel Alexander and Shea Bethe from uh, Jobs for Life. They, they help on the employment side. Step Up Ministry, Lynn and Nunnally, uh, also is on the employment side and, and starts building family and community and working with the children and making sure that when the parents are doing better, the children are doing better and learning better and learning skills. KJ Hill is involved in I don't know how many organizations on the community side, but uh, especially in Durham, working with ReCity, uh, which brings together a number of organizations within Durham uh, to focus on youth. Brace Boone at the Raleigh Rescue Mission. Their first thing is housing. But they help in a number of ways. And those of you from other nonprofits who are here, uh, again, apologize for not calling you out. Um, but you know who you are and, and you help in so many of these different areas. And I've talked with a number of other organizations here in the Raleigh area and in other cities. And there is a great need to bring them together because within each of the silos, within community development, those groups know each other, but they don't know oftentimes who the pr uh, pregnancy resource center is in, their, in other communities, sometimes not even in their own community. And those are great ways that they can strengthen each other and can learn from what everybody else is doing. And so that's what we hope to do with this. And as we make the organization stronger, as they make each other stronger by teaching one another how, what they've learned through their work and how they've found ways to be successful, they get better performance. They get better internal performance uh, with their databases. How do you manage everything? They get better governance with how do you develop a board? How do you bring board members in that fill the key needs that you have? They get to be able to perform better in terms of understanding that they don't have to do everything. They know they can get a better sense of who to transfer somebody to. And as they are able to perform better, they're able to bring more opportunities to the people who are in need. 
And so one of the things that we look to, uh, right now we're in startup mode, so we're looking for to get members and to get, to get funding. But as we work with them, we're going to measure our success by how well they are able to raise money and how well they are able to track the people who go through their systems and how well they are able to define success and be able to explain success so that everybody in the community can say, those are great organizations. Step Up Ministry is doing great things and we've seen what they've, how they've been able to, to grow through not just in the Raleigh-Durham area, but throughout the state. We've seen what the Raleigh Rescue Mission has been able to do. We've seen what Jobs for Life can do. We've seen the results that the organizations involved in ReCity and Durham are attaining and how that youth, how, the, how, how teens in Durham are in a better position than they were. And it might not show up in our government statistics. It might not show up in a news story where you can say 15% lower, 10% lower, anything else like that. But you will see the stories and you will see the individuals and you'll say there's something different here. And that's what, they, that's what these organizations do and that's what we want to help them be able to do. And the, and the other side of it is that for the donors who invest in these organizations and who invest in us, it's, you get a better return on your investment. You get a better return on your investment with these organizations than you do with, uh, with what they were before and what, with those that you would compare them to. You get a better return on investment than you get from politicians because politics is the trailing edge of culture. We are changing culture first on the ground. And when that happens, the policy finally changes when they say, you know what, this is different. Policy acknowledges the world as it is and just puts it into written form. Policy, life changes and culture changes at the margins and with the people in poverty and with the groups who are working with them. And to give you one final example of how this comes together for an individual, I'm going to go back to Tiffany. And in that minute, in that subsidized housing where she was living, a number of organizations came together and they created the Red Door Ministry. They rented one of the apartments, they painted the door red, which is a welcoming symbol, and they offered a number of services to people in the community. Her mother started going to a Bible study. Her, the father of her, uh, of her current child uh, was getting mentoring. She was able to get prenatal care throughout her pregnancy twice through one of the organizations that had a clinic there every week. Uh, and because of the relationships that that clinic had, she was able to provide clothing because she was showing responsibility and was earning points to be able to purchase clothing and toys for her babies. Through all of those organizations, through the investment that the prenatal care clinic provided through two pregnancies, so nearly two years of working with her, and the other investments that the mentoring did in the, in the community provided to her and her mother and her, and, 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 her, and her baby's father. They're working since November. They got married. They got baptized. They're going to move to a better neighborhood pretty much any day now because when, when, when we first heard the story of, of what they were doing, this was a couple months ago, um, but with a new child, they're moving to a new neighborhood, a better neighborhood. That's the power of a better yes. That's the power that these organizations are providing. And that's what we want to be able to help magnify and multiply, not just here in the Raleigh-Durham area, but in Memphis, in Atlanta, in Milwaukee, and elsewhere around the country. So you have donor cards uh, in front of you. We would love you to fill those out. I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. I hope you take some time to meet some of the folks that I pointed out. Afterwards, if you know of organizations that are, that are involved in this kind of work here in, here in the area, let me know. We need to reach them. We need to work with them. They need to be connected into this so that uh, we can all accomplish more. Um, so I thank Donna. I thank Corey for the opportunity to speak here today. I thank you all for the time and uh, open it up to questions.